Hosting provided by Host Tornado. They offer website hosting packages, dedicated servers, and VPS solutions. HostT.net. Programming Throwdown, Episode 13, C++. Take it away, Jason. Hey, man. So I had some, uh, I had some friends over, some f- friends of the family over from uh, Florida visiting the San Francisco area. Um, it was pretty fun. I got to show them around. We went to the, uh, we actually went to the, uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and then we went to San Francisco proper, I guess you'd say, and I showed them like. Have you seen that really old vintage arcade museum in San Francisco? I saw you post pictures of it. It looked oh, pretty yeah. cool, but no, before that, I haven't seen it. Yeah, so, so folks at home, check out the my G Plus page, and you'll see uh, an original Pong, which is pretty awesome, and uh, some awesome. other some other really cool, like, old school. Like, we're talking, like, 1920s or something um, arcades. Like, they actually have a bunch of these manual um, arcades. Where everything's driven by servos and, and all that. Uh, I yeah, would love to get cool. one of those in my house. Oh, it'd be awesome. They had one that was a, a real BB gun that shot what? BBs, and you had to, like, hit real targets that moved around. It was crazy. Bad idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, it shot, like, of course, like, low velocity or whatever, but... Oh, okay. Pretty epic. Uh, still. Uh. <laughs> um, yeah, but one of the interesting things, so I have a tablet. I have, uh, I think I have a Motorola Zoom and so I was kind of like playing music in the kitchen with the tablet. And, uh, you know, my friend from Florida was like, you know, I really want to get a tablet. I'm kind of really, you know, the, my techie side really wants a tablet, but I have no use case for it. And, you know, I started, you know, like I bought a tablet, so I feel like I need to like argue on the, you know, on the other side of this. So I was like, yeah, but, but, you know, you can play music. Yeah, I play music in the kitchen, and he's like, well, you know, I could just play music on my laptop. I can carry my laptop from one room to the other. And it was, like, really hard. You know, I thought about it, and I was like, yeah, you know, I bought this tablet, and I really don't do a whole lot with it. So, I don't know. It really made me think about, like, you know, how I can sort Wait, of Wait, so not only did you it. not convince him to buy a tablet, he made you feel bad for owning one? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Wow. Like, the, the only thing I really had was that I... Uh, watch movies in bed like before I go to sleep and you know it's kind of cumbersome to like do that like with a laptop like you could hold a tablet up in the air um, so you know, I, I, I don't have a Motorola Zoom but I have an iPad and uh, I, I will say that although it might be hard to come up with specific use cases I have uh, like a backup system on my computers that you know automatically backs up to the cloud or whatever just you know for for safety reasons and uh, it sends me an email when a computer isn't backed up in a certain time frame. And I keep getting emails from my laptop because I literally do not turn my laptop on maybe once every other week. Oh, wow. I don't, just don't use it anymore. And the reason being is that, well, first of all, if you have a young child like I have, a baby, that when you're like feeding the baby or holding the baby, you can't hold a laptop or you don't want to risk the baby like uh, fluids coming onto <laughs> your laptop. Yeah. And... Plus, it's just being cumbersome. But you can hold a tablet and, you know, use it while you're having to hold the baby or feed the baby or whatever. So that's one good use. Another use I found is that if I'm doing casual web browsing, it's a much better experience um, to do that on a tablet than on a sitting in front of a computer or a laptop where you're not needing to use the keyboard. So why is it there? And uh, you're having to I use see. this weird touchpad or a mouse. And I, I just, it's not like I find myself sometimes tapping on my monitor by accident. <laughs> and it's like, oh, why is this not working? And uh, so I, I find that it's useful. It's one of those things is not necessary. It doesn't give me any capability really that I didn't have before, but it's such a better user experience. I can take it from room to room. The battery on my iPad lasts an entire day of light usage um, versus my laptop will hardly last a couple hours normally three hours yeah, that's maybe. true you know i didn't think about that but yeah i mean the the zoom lasts forever like i don't even plug it in like i basically you know when the charge gets low i plug it in but i mean that's after weeks yeah and like for a laptop i find i almost always use it plugged in because the battery just tends to run down so quickly yep. and I, i'm sure there are nice laptops which don't do that but um, not mine and not most people i know yeah and so so that's a really good experience also like a tablet if you're going on a car trip, it's very easy to just pick up your tablet and use it in the back of a car. Um, and it's oh. kind of designed for this like pick up put down. 
So like you can just put it to sleep, you know, and it's instant turn back on versus a computer. You can't just like set it there for like half an hour and then pick it back up because you had a conversation because you either would have shut it down, suspended it, hibernated, it, like whatever, but it'll take 30 seconds to come back on. And that's annoying. Yeah, that's true. You know, I did one of the, you know, most recent times where I used my, uh, my uh, tablet heavily was I went on a ski bus trip. And uh, there's this program which will let you um, use a Wiimote to control your, um, like, to, to talk to your, to, to your tablet. So I actually had, like, Nintendo games running on the tablet, and the Wiimote was the controller. So, um, Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it was pretty awesome. I was actually amazed that that, that worked at all. Because I kind of, like, I, I had the idea... And I was like, oh, let me just see if there's some program like that'll let me use the Wii mode on the on the market. So I just went on market and looked up, which I guess now is called Google Play. <laughs> yeah, I went on uh, I went on Google Play and looked up, uh, uh, you know, Wii mode, and sure enough, someone had written some driver for it. So nice. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, tablets I feel are are very like when I go on a vacation now, I'm not stressed that I need to bring my laptop with me so that I'll have connection to the internet. Um, I'll Although, just bring my, you know, that's true. My but one time I got burned by that. Like when we went to uh, we went to Vegas, and uh, the room only had wired internet, and we're so used to Wi-Fi that we only brought the tablet, and we were kind of out yeah. of internet the whole trip. So, so the the way around this is that if you know this in advance, which you can typically look it up, um, mm-hmm. and once you have one, you have it, you know, for you don't need to keep buying it again. But they have uh, like travel vacation routers so it's like either they have some that are even battery powered but they also have ones that are really small which are just a very basic you know just supports a few connections that's like 30 or 40 dollars or whatever what really you can plug it into the wall yeah run it's it's like a travel router is what it is that's amazing for this very purpose oh that's such a good idea go to a hotel and there's a wi-fi and you pay to get on the wi-fi some whatever outrageous rate they tend to charge and the nicer the hotel the more they charge yeah. Um, which is which is terrible, uh, and so you can use this, pay for just the wired, plug this in, and then broadcast it, and then you know everybody traveling with you can share it. Versus if they only have Wi-Fi or you pay to use Wi-Fi, you're stuck only using because it's like tied to your MAC address typically, so you only can use yeah. it on whatever device you paid for it on. Is it pretty small? Do they make pretty small ones? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't have a specific. I don't actually own one, but I know people who do. And the ones I'm thinking of are like maybe a couple packs of card size. Wow. Oh, so. yeah. I totally have to get one of these. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, cool. I'm costing you money. I think there's a high so. probability that I'm going to get one of these. But for me to know, I'd really have to construct a graph and do a probabilistic graphical model. Oh, okay. You're leading us into our Some, next topic. Somebody um, happens to be an on. expert on that. No, 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 no. So we talked last episode <laughs> about Stanford's online classes. And so uh, I actually was really bad and I I had signed up for them, but I didn't realize signing up, you know, for like interest wasn't enough to like enroll you in the class. So I thought I was enrolled. And then I like got an email like, oh, hey, enrollment is ending this day. So I like went to check and it turned out I wasn't enrolled in, you know, a couple of the classes I had picked oh. out. So I was like, no, I had missed the enrollment deadline because they oh, try rough. to keep everybody kind of starting at the same time because they have forums and stuff and they want everybody to be around the same part of the class. And gotcha. so, uh, yeah, anyways, but I did, I'm going through the videos of two of the classes and I'm not sure that I'll actually do the homework because I've just been really swamped. Um, with family and work stuff. Yeah, but totally. I have been going through the videos of game theory and probabilistic graphical models. Awesome. Um, the game theory one is just kind of high level. There's not like programming or anything involved in it. Um, and so that one's kind of interesting uh, uh, class. Is it under economics prob- or is it under computer science? I don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah, because uh, usually so far I think I took a game theory class... I think I took a game theory class in grad school, but it was actually taught by an economics professor. So this one isn't like game theory, like how to write video games. It's just like the, you know, I guess economics version, you know, the Nash kind of game yeah, theory. Yeah, that's the best So, um, yeah, it's very intriguing and interesting. Uh, and probabilistic graphical models is turning out to be quite interesting as well. Um, it. Uh, there's not an easy way to describe it and anybody who's not very technical or or math oriented would be like why are you taking this for fun (laughs) Um, 
but but the idea is like how do you represent like dependencies so their their basic example just to be short is like you know if you want to predict somebody's grade in a class like the grade in a class that they're taking is going to be dependent on their intelligence their sat score maybe um you know the how hard the class is you know just like various other factors and so you can kind of draw like a dependency graph um, so like maybe SAT is really only dependent on intelligence and intelligence can also be a factor of um, what the grade in the class will be. And so then you don't really need it. And you kind of just draw connections between all these different factors. And then you assign weights to uh, the probabilities of various conditioning hap conditions happening. And uh, you can kind of work out things that at first would seem very, very complex to determine. And uh, I assume it will get even more complex as it goes, but basically having these models be created by just looking at the data and the algorithms to take data and generate the models. So when they say probabilistic graphical models, they're not talking about like graphics, like computer graphics. They're talking about like graphs. No, Is that right? Graphs. No? Yeah, like directed yeah. acyclical graphs. Ah, okay, gotcha. So gotcha, gotcha. yeah, I got confused at that at first too. So th is this so this is similar to like Bayesian. Yes, Bayesian okay. networks is a, is a key key part of this. Yeah. Oh, okay, now that gotcha. we just probably like totally people are like, oh man, what what are these guys talking? So yeah, about? yeah. Well, I could well ba basically Bayesian networks is or they're also called like deep belief networks. This idea that like if like they try to figure out if like things are correlated, like if one thing can influence another or not. So in other words, like if you tried to see if there was like a Bayesian relationship between like when you flipped a coin the first time and when you flipped a coin the second time, like a deep belief network would tell you like, no, you know, you flipping a coin the second time, like is not influenced by flipping it the first time. Like if, if the first time yeah. you flipped it and you got heads the second time, you still have a 50, 50 chance, you know, but like right. something else like, uh, like weather would have a Bayesian relationship. Like if it rained yesterday, it's probably more likely to rain today than if it didn't rain yeah. yesterday. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So, uh -huh. um, so yeah, so that, that sounds awesome, man. I mean, I, I, uh, I think I might start looking at that class myself. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> so yeah, so it's, it's been pretty interesting. So we'll see how it goes. Um, there's some programming assignments in this one. I want to do them. I'm just not sure that I will do them. Gotcha. Um, it's hard to do but them a comment on, the, on It's hard to do them on the tablet while holding your, your baby in the <laughs> other hand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but one interesting thing that I would like to, to talk about is that uh, I've done online classes as part of my, you know, formal education. But um, doing them here, it's interesting that you're watching the video. And I normally, uh, people at work think I'm weird, but I do my programming and I'll have one of these videos running in the background. So I'm like half listening to it. Oh, that's great. But every so often, they'll interrupt the video with like a quiz question. And it's not like scored or anything. But instead of asking you about something you've just seen to see if you're paying attention, they ask, actually ask you to answer something that they haven't quite covered yet, like the next thing they're about to talk about. Like, uh. you know, so they draw some probability and then say, what would the probability be? And then give you multiple choices. So it makes you like in class when you're actually sitting there, you're kind of having this interactive, what is it, the Socratic method or whatever, right? Like, yeah. how would you do this? What would it be? And so they're kind of trying to elicit the same uh, engagement from you. And I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, that's totally awesome, man. It's killer. Yeah. And the first couple times I rewound, I rewound the video, you don't have, I just went back. I just clicked back. Not like there was an actual rewind. Um, I went back <laughs> yeah. in the video cause I thought I wasn't paying attention and it was like, Oh wait, no, they're asking about something that hasn't occurred yet. So. <laughs> nice. So if you get it wrong, then what happens because like it could no, be they that just you tell just you why and then you watch and they typically explain ah, like, okay. what the quiz just was yeah gotcha so so i, I think if, i think if we tried to do some of the um programming problems we'd probably have a lot of trouble especially me i have <laughs> i think i'd fail pretty fast and unfortunately i just oh. don't really have a way to visualize code so that i can fail faster <laughs> Wow, you're on, you're on point today, sir. Um, <laughs> we have a news story about this. So this is actually by, I, I guess he's a, a fairly popular blogger, Jeff Atwood. I think he currently works at um, Stack Exchange, um, okay. which is a, a startup most of our listeners have probably seen before. Um, and he had an article he was writing about, I, I guess he actually posted a video that somebody else about a presentation and then a link to a website. 
But uh, it was more just the notion I wanted to talk about, which was that um, he points out that we've kind of almost regressed in the, the advancedness of our IDEs. So integrated development environments mm -hmm. that he's talking about if we could do better at trying to show programmers the impact of what they're writing, that they could uh, think through the possibilities much more quickly. Uh, so that, that's kind of vague and okay, I don't know what you're talking about. But at a basic level, if you've ever used Eclipse, first time most people use Eclipse, uh, or maybe less so now because other things do it as well, but they draw the squiggly line, you know, like the incorrect spelling under any sort of compilation error that you have in the code. And you can just kind of hover yeah. it over and it tells you what the error is, offers suggestions. And this is like a very quick way to actually help you correct the problems. And it's a delight. Yeah, and totally. so that's I mean, like at a basic I'm at the level. point now where like I'm at the point now where like I I purposely so for example like let's say I need to reference something in another file like rather than like add the statement at the top this is like include this slash this slash my file I just put uh -huh. what I want in the code I wait for Eclipse to squiggly line it <laughs> yes. and then I go over and it and I yeah, and I have Eclipse yep, add the add. line because I'm too lazy to do it myself. <laughs> uh, so I'm lazier than that. I just add a bunch and then I do Control Shift O, which basically has Eclipse try to guess at what the right imports are and oh. ask you if there's any sort of ambiguity. <laughs> That's hilarious. I didn't know that existed. Yeah, it also deletes anything that you have that isn't being used. So like if you have any imports or includes that aren't being used, it goes ahead and removes them for you. Oh, that's awesome. So... Uh, but so that's like at a basic level. But this, uh, the things that are referenced in this blog article are also even more advanced. Which is like, uh, if you had like a pathfinding algorithm or a PID, a proportional integral differential, uh, a method of controlling something, and you wanted to see how it would be affected based on various input conditions, you could do graphical representations of it. You know, and allow like a person to have a slider and see what would happen as they adjusted various thresholds in their code or uh, even better, like, you know, take it up a higher dimension and show them like a plot of, you know, on like X, Y, here's what various inputs and settings for two different variables will give you. Um, and, and just like, wouldn't it be cool if we could think about this and kind of try to make our development lives easier by doing this? Yeah, that's awesome, man. I feel like, you know, like IDEs do a pretty good job about code, like, but um, like, you know, about analyzing code, fixing code, things like that. But like that kind of stuff is actually really hard to do. Like they spend a lot of time because there's lots of customers of Eclipse, right? But for most right. things like, like scripting engines for games and things like that, it's just in general, it's just like really hard to do this kind of thing where it's like you're constantly simulating what would happen as you're making code changes and stuff. But I mean, if there's some way we could like, we could make that happen, like in a way that was like generic, it'd be amazing. It, it's one of the things people talk about for concurrency that multi-threaded is so hard because it's just too much to keep track of in our brains. And so we, you know, really have to advance the state of the compilers and the development environments to help us with this. Yeah, yeah. It's one of these things that like doesn't seem more like look at just even just undo, right? I mean, think about undo. Undo you have to there's only two there's only two ways I can think of anyways to implement undo. One is for everything you could possibly do in your program, you have to have another function that undoes it, right? That's pretty hard. And then you have to keep a list of yeah. all the things you did. <laughs> that probably isn't the way most undos are written, right? The other way is that anytime you do anything you keep like a snapshot and then undo is just going back through these snapshots, you know, but both of those are hard. You know, one means you have to be able to serialize, which means serialize means turn like a bunch of data that you have in memory or, or like a bunch of things that you're representing, like turn them into a block of ones and zeros that you can load back later. So you either have to like serialize everything so that you can deserialize it when you do the undo and then just keep all of these serialized copies of the world around or you have to as i said before create like a reverse function for everything and i mean think how hard that is like let's say you have a function that you know deletes a line of code well the reverse function has to like you have to have the yeah, line of line code thing. somewhere so that it can know what you deleted you know what i mean that kind of, just yeah. adding an undo it is, is hard. pretty hard. And so something like this is really hard, but it'd be totally awesome if it was 
if, if oh, we yeah, had I'm it. totally not saying it's easy. It's very hard, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it'd be yeah, totally definitely. sweet if we had something like that. Like, imagine... like it, It's one of those things that's interesting to think about. Yeah. Like, you have some kind of game, and you're like, oh, yeah. what happens if I, like change like the ai behavior if i make the ai more aggressive and like while you're playing it's like getting more aggressive or what if i change gravity or you know it just does all these crazy things yeah and i i think there are some things that get closer to that like i don't know if you've ever watched any of the demo videos for the unity co- uh, game engine but they have some stuff that's kind of like that where it allows you to kind of just jump in the game very quickly and see the effects of the changes you've made and then kind of jump back out oh nice yeah i haven't seen that that's pretty awesome or, or or maybe I'm making that up. I, I think I recall that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'll have to send you some videos to prove it. All right. So next article before before you lead me into it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of news coming out about the next generation of game consoles. The Wii U, I think, is supposed to be out this year or, or very soon. Yep. And the next generation Xbox and PlayStation are supposed to be out. And uh, I don't think the Wii U has had anything about this. But the Xbox and PlayStation have both had uh, these rumors come out that they're going to block uh, the ability to have used games. So either the distribution will be all online, um, so like think like Steam, or that you'll have these one-use codes, which are becoming more and more common in games for at least some portion of the features, that you have to enter a serial number or some sort of activation code to be able to play the game. And now it's mostly used like to play it online or to unlock some special you know, in-game thing. But in the future, you could actually just block the game if you don't have this code and that'll not allow people to sell the games when they're done playing them. Right. Right. Yeah. So like what will happen? Uh, uh, what will that do? So will that make the prices of games lower because now the, you know, people are making more money or will they not sell as many copies because you won't buy a $60 game knowing that you can sell it back for $30 later. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I don't, I don't really know much about the dynamics of used games. Like, I've never actually returned a game, um, but I, 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 it makes sense, you know? Like, it's it's effectively a waste of money to keep around a game you're never going to play again. So, so the way I see it is, like, you know, I have an Xbox 360, um, but I don't think... Oh, for my birthday, I got a game that was new. But aside from that one game, I play only games that are, like, two years old. And I just find, like, I go and look at the magazines online or whatever and find, like, what were the best games of two years ago? And then I buy them really cheap used. And I have no desire to play the latest and greatest games. I love playing really awesome old games. And then I can get them for, like, $5. And I much prefer doing that. And this way won't allow me to do that. But then if you look at something like Steam, I, I do buy games on Steam. Games that are, again, you know, like, nine months, a year old. And I can buy them for very, very cheap. So what you're saying is, like, if they keep reducing the price over time as the game gets older, then for you as a consumer, it's effectively the same. But the difference yeah. is, instead of GameStop, like, getting this, like, essentially, like, arbitrage, um, y- you know, you're buying it straight from the publisher again. And the person who would have sold the game new can't. So the... Yeah, so I, I I don't know exactly what I'm saying, but uh, <laughs> I, I do think there is an interest here, like to see what will happen, and like one part of me says like, oh, it's in their you know ability to ban used game sales if they want, but then the other part of me says it's my freedom, like I should be allowed to sell my game, like I own the game, and I don't really like the idea of we're going to this subscription or license based model, like you bought this software CD, but you didn't really you don't own the software. You own permission to rent it for an you know unlimited time, but only for you. And I don't really like that. Really, yeah. You know, a lot of people come up with this argument, like with music and movies and things like that. Personally, it's that's never really bothered me. It only bothers me when Steam goes down, and then you know, and it's <laughs> one of these things. It's so funny, right? Like I could go weeks without playing a video game, but then like Steam goes down, and it's just like instantly, it's like oh. I really want to play and I can't. You know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. I don't know. It's like the forbidden fruit, I guess, or something. There's some like psychological <laughs> thing going on there, but uh, well, the, but yeah, it's really my, frustrating when you can't play because it's down. That's one aspect of it. So always being needed to be connected to the internet or at least often being connected. That's kind of annoying because you could be extended periods of time where you're not, yep. and that would be bad. But the other thing is like I run into occasionally where. Like I have a computer and then I have my laptop and then my wife has a computer and I feel like 
you know, I want my family, like I don't want to give it to other people, but I want my family to be able to share one version of this. And I don't like the idea that I have to keep buying it over and over again. Oh, that's for true. What amounts to like one shared juice because it turns out like we're only ever using one at a time. Like I'm not using it at the same time as my wife at the same time as, you know, my kids. Like it would only be only one of us using it at the same time. But we want to be able to have it on different computers at the same time. Yeah. So like Steam kind of allows that, but like other things don't. It's pretty BS that like you can't have two instances of Steam running at the same time. So like in other words, like I couldn't play one game and my wife play a different game on the same Steam account at the same time. Like that seems ridiculous. You know what I mean? Like yeah. like not being yeah. able to play the same Steam game. I I, I mean if it, I personally think that's not entirely fair, but I understand how that could be exploited. You know. But if you have three games, you should be able to play all three of them at the same time. So wait, so with Steam, if you have the same account, you can't even like own two copies of the same game in the account and then like two people play them. You have to have right, like, like a, a separate account own the second version. Yeah, as soon as as soon as you log yeah. into Steam, it kicks you out of all your other instances. Like if there uh, are any. Yeah. Maybe well, speaking about Maybe the you could do something like in, oh. offline or something. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, no, no. I was going to transition. That was going to be you. <laughs> uh, it's okay. So Prince of Persia. I remember that game. That game was pretty awesome. Yeah, Prince of Persia, definitely uh, no DRM on that. Came out 23 years ago. <laughs> but uh, did you ever beat that game or get, like, really far or anything? No. That no. game was so hard, man. Like, like, we all played it when we were kids. And I don't know anybody who got... You know, it actually had different themes. Like, you started off in the castle... And then you went to like some cave theme, supposedly. I I think it's I don't think any of this really. I don't think exists. I ever beat the first level. That's what I'm saying. Like I don't know anybody who got past the second or third level of that game, and it has like supposedly like 20 levels or something like that. What? Yeah, ah. it's like uh, there's another game like this. Uh oh, it's like Frogger. Like, did you know Frogger has like all this complexity? Like after you get past this, like the first level, you have to get all the little frogs in the top, right? Uh-huh. Then uh, then the next level, the cars move faster, and there's, like, a snake that goes on the sidewalk before you get to the turtles. I think I've been there before. Yeah. yeah. And, like, the th- it just gets crazier and crazier. The third level has, like, alligators, and then, like, the fourth level has, like, other kind of cars. The fifth level, like, it gets to the point where, like, you have to save your girlfriend frog, and she has to go in what? the same hole as you. Yeah. No. It gets, it gets, I'm serious, uh. dude. It gets, you have to watch the video or something. It's crazy. Um. Anyway, so oh, okay. So why we were bringing up so, Prince of Persia? Yeah. So the Prince of Persia, awesome game, came out a long time ago. Maybe we'll go back and play it now that we're older, and ah, we'll still suck at it. But anyways, uh, I have it on my iPad, but I'm still just as terrible at it. Do you? That's hilarious. Um, yes. So the guy who wrote Prince of Persia lost the source code, and uh, I actually, from the article, I don't think it talks about how he lost it. Um, let me just scan it really quick. Uh, along the way, he misplaced it. Yeah, so somehow he lost the source code, maybe a hard drive crash, I don't know. And, uh, uh, you know, I guess forever, like, you know, he, he always kind of wanted to go back and have the original. I'm sure it's been recreated a hundred times, but there's a lot to be said for having the original code with the comments yeah, and, like, yeah. maybe the jump used to be longer and, comments. and he shrunk the jump. <laughs> speed or something you know like all these like you, you see the organic nature of like the game right uh so it turns right. out his father was going through some of his old boxes and found the source code on some floppies and uh nice. he's going to uh he, him and he's got somebody who's going to port the game i'm assuming to sdl or something something where we could play it on modern pcs and then open source the whole thing cool so yeah it's cool. pretty cool you know i mean when they open sourced like doom and quake 3 and stuff like that it's always like yeah i'm gonna make my own game and and then you get into it and it's like <laughs> the code is such crap like you'd be better off buying a game engine you know but well, well let's be polite let's be polite it's a complex game that's very difficult and the people probably were awesome programmers but it is very difficult to read not knowing what's going on oh yeah yeah actually yeah you're right we should do this justice so the code's crap no, <laughs> but <laughs> no but basically you think about it you know prince of persia you look at the video and we have the link you can watch a video of the gameplay and you think oh you know i could hack that up i could write that in javascript or something like an html or something you know but at the time this totally pushed the limits like like having like 
a panel that fell when you walked on it. It was like, whoa, big deal. Like, like he had to like write his own memory manager to make that work or whatever, you know, because <laughs> so, so because of the, because of the, you know, for one, the technology being new, like either they were pioneers inventing the technology as they went, um, or, you know, it had just come out. A combination of that and just the limited computational resources, it, there's just, the code is almost always full with, filled with tons and tons of hacks and things like that yeah uh, but that in and of itself is interesting to read so when the source code comes out we'll definitely revisit this and uh you know take a look at okay. what sort so of you're craziness. gonna go through it and give us your uh line by line commentary yeah i'll dive through the code uh, line by <laughs> maybe i'll do a file <laughs> by file it'll probably all be in one file prince.c next something. episode will be jason reading the code of prince of persia to us <laughs> yeah exactly bedtime stories with jason yeah that'll definitely i'll make myself fall asleep <laughs> oh no oh, are we ready for our tool of the bye week tool of the bye week all right you go first what's your tool well uh keeping in my theme from last week uh or two weeks ago of completely absolute opposite of tools and instead things that waste your time <laughs> uh this week not that i've had much time to play it but I did play a little bit of DC Universe Online, which is a massively multiplayer online role-playing game. And uh, it's free-to-play now. And nice. I'm a lot of these that are free-to-play, like I've tried them a couple times, and they, they always want you to end up buying something. Oh, totally. But this one actually has a lot of content. Like, I didn't feel the... Like, I don't even know where you were supposed to buy something at. Like, I was just playing, and it was not a big deal. Wow. And so that that's really cool. And I didn't get very far, and like I said, I've been pretty busy, so I pretty much just installed it and played around for, like, an hour or something. Um, but it, it is really cool. So if you're uh, interested in being some of the cool comic book heroes, uh, check it out, dcuniverseonline.com, and it's free to play now. And as far as I can tell... You can do a, a lot in the game without needing to pay anything extra. So how many people do you play with? Like, I know it's massively... So there's different kinds of massive multiplayer, right? Like, there's yeah, EVE yeah. Online, where it's, like, literally, like, thousands and thousands One of people. One universe. Yeah. yeah. And then there's also, like, on the other end of it, there's Yahoo Games, which has, like... 10,000 people playing chess, but you're only playing with one person. You know what I mean? Right. Both of those are so considered I, MMOs, on... but, you know. So where does this fall in that spectrum? <laughs> so um, I don't know that I ever ended up kind of, like, doing a mission with somebody else, but it kind of depends on the mission. Like, there's some stuff you can just kind of go off and do yourself. But oh, okay. then there's other stuff where you can be in a party of, you know, probably, like, six or seven people. Oh, okay. I don't remember exactly how bad. many it was, but, Yeah. So it's not and, – and I mean sometimes you'll be in an area where there are many, many people, but it's not like you're all doing the same thing together. Oh, did, does they have a, do they have a pretty good cust, uh, character customization? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, I was playing Star so you, Trek online and uh, they gave you like a little bit too much freedom with the character customization. And uh, I'll have to put a screenshot or something, but it's, it's pretty epic. <laughs> I have this, I have this character, and she has. So you know, they have like a ton of sliders. Like you ever play this game where it's like. Wait, 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 wait. Should we just cut this off before we even go there? No, 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 no. It's not. It's not. No one's gonna <laughs> okay, should be offended right. by this. But but they have. You know, like you play like I think Skyrim has this, where it's like they have a slider for your nose, and you slide it all the way, and you get a huge nose or a tiny nose, or slider for your cheekbone height or whatever. All this crazy stuff. So this game was like that, just pages and pages of sliders. And uh, so I made a character that had huge legs, like really, really long legs, and then extremely tiny waist, extremely <laughs> tiny torso, extremely tiny neck, huge arms, and then a huge head. And so it basically looked like a four-armed octopus. <laughs> and like because the legs were so big and disproportionate they the character floated this is on star trek online the character floated above the ground because it was so glitchy the character like the legs clipped through each other when the character walked uh... and the head like clipped through any doorways because the character's like eight feet tall or something <laughs> and so and the arms were so long that they cut through you know the legs too like constantly clipping through and uh you know, I played a mission and literally like I'd walk around like the hub area and people would just give me money and laugh at me because my character is so bizarre. And then finally we did a mission and at the end of the mission, everybody did some kind of like dance or salute or something. 
and and my the rig got so thrown off with these proportions that the character actually the arm inverted like the arm oh, no. went inside like through the inside through out. the arm socket and like back out the head or something <laughs> it was oh. totally awesome man yeah my character like purple skin <laughs> So if you see somebody matching this description online, say hi. <laughs> yeah, that's probably me. Oh man. So my uh, all right. So what about your tool of the bye week? My tool of the bye week is uh, XFX. Oh, sorry, SFXR, which is a pretty cool 8-bit sound generator. Um, and a lot of people have used this. If you've ever played the game VVVVV. It's like a like yes. an indie game, like a platformer, and it looks like it was a Commodore It's a way to die game. ten times in three seconds. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think I died. Like they show you your death count at the end of the game, which is ridiculous. Like eight thousand. Wait, you or beat something. the game? Yeah, I did eventually. Ah. Oh, yeah, because you have. You made me feel so bad. You have infinite lives, right? So eventually you'll get. Yes, to but the I end. just kept dying for like an hour. <laughs> yeah, I pretty much I died for like a week, and then the game ended. <laughs> But you've re- you've died 1,000 times. Congratulations, you win. <laughs> yeah, Sticking exactly. through it. <laughs> but uh, this guy was part of a indie game hackathon where it's like make a game in a day kind of thing. And uh, he, you know, he had some background in audio. And so he he made an 8-bit uh, you know sound generator. And it's pretty cool. Like you can you can actually put bullet and it will like click random and it'll make a bunch of random like 8-bit sounds with square and triangle waves that that kind of sound like a bullet like it's, it's hard i don't have any background in audio so i don't really know how to explain it other than to say you know there's a bunch of buttons but not so much <laughs> that it's overwhelming and the buttons are pretty intuitive like like angry or something like that you know and you just sort of like weld all these adjectives and nouns together and then click random a bunch of times until you get the kind of sound you want um, but it's, it's really oh, cool. cool yeah make some great sounds uh, exports to wave which you know, then you can put in Audacity and export to AUG or MP3 or whatever. And uh, yeah, I definitely, if I ever need to make sounds for anything, uh, definitely be using it again. So good stuff. Well, it, you know, if you're ever making a game, what programming language would you use? Well, if I was making a game, I'd probably, I'd want something that had like a lot of performance. So I'd definitely be writing that in C++. Oh, okay. Well, that that was maybe a little bit unfair, but it's a transition <laughs> to our programming language of the episode. It's a shame we haven't C++. talked about C++ and people just can't make games because, you know, we haven't given them any guidance. Yeah, I think there's other ways to make games too. But yeah, probably. Anyways. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the history of C++. Now, C++ uh, is obviously the plus plus meaning that it wasn't the first so there was something before it and we've talked about that before that was c yep totally. and uh somebody had the idea to kind of make c better uh and that person was would you care to pronounce uh, i'll do my best i think it's bjarn straustrup i don't know if that's right or not i've actually only read the name so never actually yeah, me as well pronounced it but it's- yeah, so uh, so he, Mr. Strostrup, um, we're going to get all sorts of corrections, I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah, he had the idea that, you know, he wanted to, to add classes to C. And so, um, w- you know, with anything, as C was coming out, people were hesitant because they wanted to write everything in assembly. And then as C++ came out, you know, oh, we're going to have this classes thing. He, he wanted to be able to show people, look, it really is just kind of like C, but better. And yep. so the original compiler was actually just to compile C++ to C and then use the existing C compilers to generate machine code. Yep. I mean, if you put yourself in his shoes, like people had been really working on C compilers for a long time, um, you know, and they were highly optimized and things like that. And, you know, you want to invent your own language. If you make your own compiler to assembly, it's not going to be anywhere near as good as C, you know, because they've done so many optimizations. So, you know, as a first step, it makes sense. He wrote the C++ compiler to go to C, and then you can use your highly optimized C compiler. It's sort of like what's going on now with LLVM. Yes, yes. And, uh, it, 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 I mean, it, 
people eventually you know started to come around and say wow this is this is nice but there was the original versions and you'll still hear if you uh, go to somewhere where people have been programming for a long time especially uh, performant programs for a long time a lot of people still have a hesitancy of c++ because they think it's so much more inefficient than c right and, and that just has to do with the idea that you know those original versions when you were translating from the C++ to the C it generated you know kind of more C code than a hand coded C program just like a you know program written in C generates typically more instructions than a hand coded assembly program yep yeah totally i mean i think that one of the things too is and you know we've we've touched on this before but just to recap it's in the end it really comes down to how you use the language like it, for C++ for example uh, you know, as we mentioned, it's C with classes. If you have, uh, you know, let's say you're doing some kind of like fluid dynamics, right? And so you have a bunch of air, a bunch of cells which have you know water in them that are moving in a certain direction. Well, if you make a separate class for every cell, and then you try and do some kind of fluid dynamics where you go to all the classes, and then in each class you do some like computation. That's going to be way slower than just having an array of floats, right? Or something like that. So, like, that's an example where, like, you don't really want to make a class for, like, everything. You just want an array of floats. And then maybe just one class that does, like, the fluid dynamics for the whole world or whatever, you know? So, you know, in the beginning, with most languages, people, it's a combination of the language isn't optimized, but then also people don't really know what to do with the language. Um, but then yeah, over, yeah, over time, people start, you know, the language, as it gets more adoption, people start to understand the best ways to use it. Now, C++ doesn't have versions like some other languages. Like, there's not C++ 1.0, 2.0. Right. There, there's nothing like that. Yeah. There, but the, go you, yep, go ahead. Oh, there is a new version coming out. And uh, have you studied this at all? I did look into it a little, you know, having some background in C++, I was very intrigued, like, oh, they're upgrading, you know, what are they going to add? Like, how are they going to bring this into the, you know, kind of 21st century? And uh, so it was originally, you know, going to be called C++, you know, 0x or whatever, you know, implying that it would come out in the single digits of the 2000s. Uh, but they kind of missed that deadline and getting agreement on what they were going to put in. So I think the official name ended up being C++11. Oh, um, I didn't know for that. Coming out in 2011. I always thought well, that's it was what C++ Wikipedia plus TR1 me. or something. Oh. Well, I think that was the one of the early versions of the 0x before uh, it got fully ratified or whatever. Got it. Um, and so C++11, which uh, we haven't talked about all about what C++ has, but they just try to make the language a little easier to use while at the same time keeping it being powerful and adding, try to add some stuff for, you know, the idea of multi-threading and concurrency, which wasn't as big uh, when C++, of course, was in earlier versions. Um, and then just making some things nicer, like kind of inferring what values should be as opposed to having to make them explicit. Or if you have like a constant function, um, you can uh, create an array by calling that function and, you know, like adding a number to it. So like if you have a function that just returns the number five, you can make the size of the static array be, you know, calling this function plus two and it'll be, it knows to make it seven. Ah. Um, whereas before that would have been illegal um, because in C++, the static arrays, you know, have to have a constant size definition. Gotcha. Yeah. One of the big things that's in the new C++ um, that, that, uh, you know, it's probably actually, it's probably not that big, but it's really important for me anyways, cause, uh, it's good for people who want to develop quickly is something called a shared pointer. And so what this is, is <clears throat> as we talked about in the C podcast, you know, C plus plus and C, most of the time you're dealing with pointers that you allocate. So you say, you know, Hey computer, give me a chunk of memory so that I can do something with it. And usually, you know, in C++, in C, you would say malloc. In C++, you say new. But they do, like, close to the same thing. And, uh, and then later on, when you're done with that memory, in C, you would say free, and then the chunk of memory. In C++, you say delete. But it's the same kind of thing. Once you're done with the memory, you have to delete it. Otherwise... Uh, so you're in control of memory management. Right. Right. So, and if you don't delete the memory, then eventually you will run out of memory because you'll just keep creating, 
asking the You'll computer for memory and not returning it back, right? You'll leak memory. So what shared pointer does is you wrap your new inside the phrase shared pointer and uh, it knows that uh, it knows when to delete it. So basically it does what's called reference counting. So if you say like shared pointer X equals new int, well now like X points to a reference, X contains a reference saying, hey, right now X is using int. So, you know, we got to keep it around. Then later on, if you say Y equals X, now there's two references. So like behind the scenes, it's saying, hey, you know, two people, Y and X, are both using this integer, so we can't free it. And then eventually your program keeps running, keeps running, and then just as part of the program, Y and X, let's say, fall out of scope. Like maybe they're part of another shared pointer, like they're in a class that is, is itself contained in a shared pointer or your program ends or whatever. Um, it says, hey, there's no more references to this int, so now I can free this int. So it does all the freeing for you. Um, that's one really nice thing that was added in the new C++. So does that mean they've added garbage collection to C++? Um, boy, that's a hard question. Ant. I guess <laughs> technically... So, so for people, I don't know if we've explained garbage collection. I think we did a little when we talked about Java, but I'm not oh, okay. sure. Okay, well, we'll explain it just really quick. Garbage collection is the idea that, um, you know, over time, there. Are, so some languages like Java, you don't free things, and um, but because of there's like, a, actually, so no. It, to answer the question now, now that I thought about it, no, it doesn't implement garbage collection. And so what that means is, let's say you have um, shared pointer X that uh, points to some class. And then that class has a shared pointer Y that points to X. So you have a loop, right? So X refers to something that has Y and Y refers back to something that has X. Mm -hmm. um, in Java, the garbage collector will run every now and then and it'll say, hey, you know, these two things are referring to each other but they're, nothing refers to them. They're isolated, and there's actually no way to get to X um, because there's no way to get to Y, and Y is the only thing pointing to X. So, so we're going to delete X and Y. Okay. Um, that's garbage collection, or that's one part of it. Um, so C++ doesn't do that. So actually, if you have a circular reference and um, you don't sort of clean it up yourself, then um, you'll leak memory that way. So that's actually a really good point. Very subtle, but it happens. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it is kind of a, a, a loose approximation of it in some ways, but uh, some people don't like garbage collection because the idea that, and in Java has gotten better about like allowing you to specify when and how garbage collection will run, but the idea that something's going to run that you don't have control over. And in a lot of uses of C++, people want to have absolute control over everything that's running and when it runs and how it runs. Right. Like you'll see in a lot of like <clears throat> a lot of games, especially like the critical, you know, graphics or physics loop in a game, they allocate everything up front. So in other words, you know, they create an array like right when the game starts, they create an array for like, let's say it's NBA live, some basketball game. They create an array for 30 players, like to include the players on the court and on the bench. Right. And for 30 ragdolls and their physics engine. And they just, that's it, you know? And so so when the first player gets initialized, like after you pick your team, you pick Philadelphia 76ers or whatever, and it starts initializing players, there's already locations in memory for those ragdolls. And then it just kind of fills in the specifics. But all of the memory gets allocated up front. And that's because, as Patrick's suggesting, like you don't want to be allocating and deallocating memory you know, while the game is running, because what that means is you have no way of guaranteeing how long something will take. Like you're, you're, if you're writing C++, you're often in an environment where your boss is coming to you and saying, look, Patrick, you have 10 milliseconds, you know, like you have every cycle, you have 10 milliseconds. That's probably a lot. You have one millisecond <laughs> dedicated to like the graphics engine. And so if you ever take more than a millisecond, some red flag's gonna go off, right? The game's gonna stutter. Yeah, that's right. You're gonna get frame drops. Yep. And so, uh, yeah, if you use something like, like Python or Java or something like that, you run the risk of, 
oh, every 300 frames or so, the garbage collector kicks off, and uh, now you're 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 hiccuping. So so we 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 got a little ahead of ourselves, maybe somewhat talking about kind of how C plus plus is used. Um, but so, what are some of the features that C plus plus has that people like? Yeah, so these are the big things that, you know, as we mentioned, C++ is used for, like, really time-critical programs and uh, um, things like that. But uh, you might ask yourself, well, why not use C? Like, what what does C++ really bring to the table, right? And one of the biggest things is, obviously, classes and the things that come with classes, like virtual functions with inheritance. C++ actually has multiple inheritance. Um you know, different. So wait, what does that mean? Yeah, so so in uh, in Java, we might have talked about this inheritance, but basically, let's say you have a class like uh, let's say you have a class called um, Shape. Shape. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, so you have Shape, and then uh, Square and Circle both inherit from Shape, and Shape is an abstract class, which means that Shape contains some functions that that aren't implemented and because it's abstract you can't actually create a shape so you know in C++ you would say abstract class shape right and you'd give it a function let's say area get area and get area would be what's called a pure virtual function so in C++ lingo uh, pure virtual function means that someone else who's uh, implementing or inheriting this class has to create the get area function because the shape class can't do it. So then you have say square and the square class inherits from shape and square class will define get area. So it's like, you know, int get area and then do side times side, right? You'd also have the circle class and the circle class inherits from shape as well. And it's get area function would do uh, what radius times pi, right? Or radius was it radius squared times pi or something for the area? Yes, yes, pi r squared. Yeah, yes. that's right. So, so it's two different classes that have different get area functions, but they both inherit from shape. Then what you can do later on, let's say you're making a physics engine or something, you can have an array of shapes. Even though you can't create a shape directly, you can do what's called downcasting. So you can have an array of shapes, and then you can say, oh, I want to add a square to this array. So I can say, like, shapes.add new square, shapes.add new circle, shapes.add new square for another square. And then you can go through this list of shapes and get the area for all the shapes, even though, you know, you don't necessarily know which one's a square and which one's a circle, you know that both of those have the get area function because they extended or they inherited from shape. So that's kind of in a nutshell inheritance. Now, um, what multiple inheritance means is kind of what the name suggests. You can inherit from multiple things, and this is really useful. So especially, let's say, um, let me think of an example. Let's say, <laughs> <laughs> let's say, like a square is a uh, shape. But a square is also something that can be drawn, like a renderable. So you're making a game, you have this, these square, let's say you're making like Angry Birds or something, right? So, uh, and you have something called circle, which is going to be your Angry Bird. So circle is a renderable, like you want to actually draw, you know, a little bird shaped circle. But then it's also a shape in the physics sense, like you want it to bounce like a circle. So your your class, your Angry Bird class, would extend, would inherit um, shape and inherit um, circle at the same time. So uh, multiple inheritance actually gives C++ a lot of power. And Java does try to handle the same thing, but it does it through what's called interfaces. So um, you can kind of inherit multiple inheritance by mo inheriting multiple interfaces, but interfaces are restricted in what they can be. And C++ basically allows you to inherit from multiple things, which are more complex than just an interface. Right, exactly. And, and then one other comment, I, I think abstract is a Java term, right? I think in C++, the class just has a function which is defined as virtual and then set equal to zero to make it an abstract class. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, I think you might be right. I thought it was... <laughs> 
It's okay. I've been uh, doing yeah. Just, I've been doing Java. We both for done too a lot long. of C <laughs> but we've both been doing Java recently. So uh, yep. if if we get a little sketchy, we're sorry. I thought that um, is it a virtual class then or no? It's a virtual class if it has at least one virtual function. Oh, that's right. Is, is that yeah, right? Yeah, you're you're totally right. So yeah, and C plus plus is just a class. You don't put abstract right. in front. In Java, you put abstract in front. Yeah. But um, yeah. if you, as Patrick said, if you have any virtual functions, and the way you make a virtual function is, you put the prototype. Like in the case of the shape, you'd put, you know, int get area, um, and then parentheses. Well, but then virtual instead of int, oh right, virtual yeah, int virtual int get area in parentheses. But then instead of putting, uh, you know, function there, a you'd body. put equal right. You'd put equal zero. And uh, that lets the compiler know that you know anyone who that that anyone who extends or anyone who implements this function or this class is going to have to create the get area function. Yeah, they must override it because you can't come up with a good generic implementation of it. Right. Yep. The other thing that C plus plus allows you to do is something called templating, um, which uh, a lot of high level languages allow you to do. But this is basically instead of having to have so like in let's say get area. You might want to be able to get areas with integers, but maybe also doubles, or maybe I, I don't know, like imaginary area. Is that even possible? <laughs> I don't complex know. Complex numbers. Um, complex number area, I, I guess maybe. Anyway, so you might want to have like all these different things, but instead of having to write, if the if the way it's handled is very similar, then you may not want to have to write like get integer area, get double area, get float area. Right. Um, that would be very tedious. So templating allows you to write the function once. If area is just, let's say, in the in the case of just you know squares and rectangles, uh, you know width and height, and you're just multiplying them together, and it doesn't matter what type they are, then basically it allows you with a special syntax to define like, hey, the person has to specify what type it is when they call this, but I don't care what type it is, or even like I care but only in a certain way, and so that then it's just you know width times height. And you don't care if those are integers or floats or doubles. It'll just kind of handle it for you. Right. Yeah, it's really interesting. What the compiler actually does with templates is, you know, it looks at all the times you use the class and it creates that many copies of the class. So in other words, let's say you had a list and you had a, like, the list class was templated. Then later on in your program, you have a list of integers, and then later on you have a list of shapes, and then later on you have a list of floats, like throughout different places in your program. Well, the compiler will count all those up, and then it will actually take your list class and create copies of it. So you'll have a, like a float list, you'll have an int list, you'll have a, uh, you know, a shape list. But it does all this for you like behind the scenes, so you don't have to actually go through all the trouble of duplicating, copying, and pasting all of your own code. And that is powerful. The reason that it does that allows you to do, which we won't get into, because I don't even know if you could describe it in a podcast. It'd be kind of hard verbally, but templated metaprogramming. Oh, yeah. The, <laughs> that, that, which uh, are programs that you write that get run at compile time, not at runtime. Yeah, totally. So... There are some so, things you need to we'll do. <laughs> yeah, I'll just, I'll go real real quick over okay, this. Okay, all right, you can try. There are some things that you need to know at compile time, but you need to use equations. Let's say you have three plus four in your program. Well, you know the com the computer the the compiler doesn't know that that's seven. The compiler like you have to actually run the program, and then your computer once running the program will do the three plus four, and then return seven. But there are some things, like some computations, that need to be known at what's called at compile time. So like while the compiler is compiling, it needs to know that this 3 plus 4 is 7, or this x plus y is whatever it is. And so to actually do this plus at compile time, you can, you can actually do things like this using what's called, as Patrick mentioned, template metaprogramming. But uh, it's pretty... It's it's very rare that you have to do something like that, but it does come up. It's one of those things that's really cool, but if you use it, chances of other people understanding what you're doing are low. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, something else that C++ adds is operator overloading. So once you define a class, it would be really nice uh, if you could do something, you know, like I want to add two of my classes together. Like my classes represent probabilities, and I want to add these two probabilities together and have them be added 
in a way that is unique to the probabilities of my classes that are defined. And so I want to redefine how the plus is uh, what happens when I say, you know, my shape and then the plus sign and the, or, you know, my probability, the plus sign, and then, you know, another instance of my probability. And C++ allows you to do that. So you can still use the plus sign, but it knows to call special code that you wrote to do that operation. Yeah, totally. And I don't think Java supports that, right? Oh, you put me on the spot. I'm not sure. I mean, I know it didn't used to. It, I mean, now they've been adding a lot of stuff to Java. No, I'm pretty sure. Let me just double check. But I'm almost <laughs> well, talk 100 percent sure. Uh, the one that we, you know, there's many, many things that we can continue to talk about. But another one we talk about is that C++ adds exception handling, and uh, this is kind of a controversial topic. You know, whether or not exception handling is something that should be used or shouldn't be used, how expensive is it, how cheap is it, and everybody's got their kind of thing. But C++, if you want to use exception handling, so throwing and catching exceptions, it does add that capability. So interestingly enough, I'm really glad I looked this up. So Java, you know, doesn't support operator overloading. So what that means is, like, and the example they use is there's a class in Java called big integer. And as the name suggests, it can hold an integer of effectively infinite size, right? It'll just keep allocating memory and, uh, uh, you know, as, as much as it needs to hold any size number. Uh, and so to add two big integers, you actually have to say a dot add parentheses b because you cannot do a plus sign b like you can in C++. Ah. But Scala, which is a language derived from Java that we probably should do a podcast on, um, sometime Scala actually does have operator overloading so oh, okay. that's that's pretty wild yeah that's cool but yeah C++ uh, as Patrick mentioned clearly has operator overloading and it's amazing so useful it is uh, but it can catch you if you think plus does what a normal plus does and somebody redefined it to be something else yeah, that could be dicey. Oh, that could or be rough. Or they can redefine what the square brackets are. So normally that's like indexing an array, but you use it to mean something else. Yeah, that could be bad. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you should do that. Typically, so. if you if you operate if you overload an operator, you, there's this understanding that you're going to do something that's intuitive to everybody. Um, so like even if you could, you know, let's say add two graphs together, typically you'll use a function for that just because you want to have a function with a descriptive name, like maybe like like merge graphs with edges or something like that. Like you want to let the person know kind of when you add these two graphs together, what are you really doing? Um, if, if, you, uh, if you do like just an operator, a plus sign for two graphs, then what somebody else thinks adding two graphs is might differ from what you think. That can cause so drama. The, the, the strengths of C++, we already kind of started on them. And uh, some of it is that uh, traditionally it's been kind of the, well, you know, along with C, kind of the very fastest way to get stuff done, um, or at least relative to most other programming languages. Right. Like just to give an example, <laughs> um, I wrote a, I actually wrote a nes -izer, which is <laughs> just a name I made up, but basically it takes pictures and it does like, takes the nes like the old nintendo palette like the color palette from nintendo with like 54 colors or something and it um it does like this k-means clustering it does like way more than it really needs to but it it tries to make the image look like it would if a nintendo like video game designer drew it so you could just give it a picture of your face and it'll look like your face like belonged in a nintendo game but awesome but yeah i wrote it in python and it takes like probably 10, 15, it probably takes about a minute to run. Um, I, so, and t to test it became hard to debug because, you know, it'd literally take a minute, I'd find a bug, it'd take a minute. And I rewrote it in C++ and it runs almost instantly. Now, now there were probably things you could have done in Python to make it run faster. Yeah, I mean, I could uh, have But the used... idea is that out of the box, the generic way of writing it in Python versus C++, C++ will end up being faster. Yeah, that's a good point. So Python actually, ironically enough, Python has what's called C types, which adds support for C and C++ like data structures. And I could have used the C types array and stuff. So so don't take that as a, as a slam on Python or anything like that. It's not like... Your your uh, your your code will just—it's not magic or anything like that. Um, so you know, but but yeah, if 
if you just code normally, uh, you know, your code will, will typically be much faster on C++. So another thing is that the object oriented allows for collaboration amongst very large teams in an easy way. So Jason's working on the shape class and I'm going to inherit from it. And I don't really, well, that's a bad example. So we both have the shape class and I'm going to implement square and he's going to implement circle. And, you know, as long as if we have kind of the interfaces between those defined, we can all work at the same time on our own pieces of code. And that's very nice. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it makes it very easy to write you know, APIs. And one thing about C++ that a lot of languages don't have, C++ has separate header files and source files. And so the idea is the header file, also called like the .h or the .hpp file, will sort of have a description of what your class looks like. So it'll say, hey, you have this class, it's called Patrick Wheeler. You know, it has this function called get area <laughs> but uh. it has these like it has it has these functions you know you have this like shape class it has get area it has you know some other thing like get boundaries get center or something like that and then it also in addition to the dot h file there's a dot cc file or dot cpp file depending on what extension you use but both of them are the same which actually has the implementation so if you have some class, let's say it's file reader, you know, the .h file would just show like there's a function called read, there's a function called read line, there's a function called close. But then if you go to the .cc file, you'll see actually what read does and what close does, you know, what read line does. Um, and so this is really nice because you can give people the .h file and they can get an understanding really quickly of what your program does without having to, or like rather what the architecture of your program is, without having to know what each function does. Yeah. So if, <clears throat> if you're on like a huge team, you know, and the other thing is the .h files, you might make those like up front and not change them very often. So let's say I'm working on some graphics engine. I can just hack together some .h files. I can say, okay, I know there's gonna be a graphics engine and it's gonna have a list of shapes and the shapes there's going to be a square and a circle and there'll be some get area functions and some rendering functions and i'll just send this to patrick so he has an idea of what i'm going to do and then he can code to those dot h files and he can include them in his code and then you know we can both work in parallel that way so it's a great way to communicate the language itself allows you to do things like that so some of the weaknesses um, we talked about that you have absolute control over the memory and so it's in a similar way, just in having memory leaks, you can also have memory corruption that, you know, you can overwrite other pieces of code if you're, you know, C++ has a notion of a pointer. So it's this variable holds a memory address, but I can change what the memory address points to. And as long as if my program has permission to write there, I can write whatever I want to that. Right. Yeah. I mean, a big case where things like this happen is, um, Let's say you have an array, and the array, ha the array has 10 elements, and you're looping through the array. Um, so you might have a loop that says, like, go from 1 to 10. Um, like, you might say, at the top, it might say, okay, int size equals whatever the size is. So <laughs> now my size variable is set to 10. And then I write this for loop that goes from 1 to size. But, but I, I never try to recalculate size. I just know it's 10. And I go through this for loop and do some stuff. Well, what if my program is multi-threaded? And while I'm in this for loop, somebody else goes through and deletes like a few elements. Well, now I'm going to go through 1 to 10, but there's only 5 elements. And C++, it won't give you an error or a crash or anything like that. It'll actually just read whatever memory is there. You know, and like this happens, the worst the case where this kind of happens even worse than adding elements or removing elements is you might add an element so let's say you add the 11th element and that causes your vector to shift to another location in memory and you just you end up with all sorts of crazy stuff where you know you're just you're reading memory that doesn't make sense and but you're not crashing you're getting data it's just bogus and uh, yeah. so these are incredibly hard to debug and this is why a lot of old school games have these like really esoteric or really like interesting errors. Like you ever see the negative one world in Mario? No. 
Oh man, you should watch his YouTube video. There's there's a glitch in Mario, and you can exploit the glitch and actually go to the world negative one. Um, there's another bug in Castlevania 2 for Nintendo, where you can uh, and these these are both written in C, but the same kind of bugs can happen in C plus plus. Where in Castlevania 2, you can actually fall through the ground at, at like a very specific spot. And you're in, like, random memory in the game. <laughs> and so, like, effectively, like, some percentage is based on, you know, randomness or whatever of the ground is hard and the rest of it is fall through. So, like, you're not stuck. And you can actually, people have, like, just spent days just going through this crazy world where you're just walking through the memory and everything's crazy. And one guy got to the spot in memory where the the time was being, like, you know, put and so, like, as the seconds ticked, like, the the world shaped in, like, weird ways. It's really trippy. <laughs> and so, but the point is, like, you don't get a crash with, like, hey, at this point in your code, you know, something weird happened. You just, weird things happen with, with no way to track them down. Yeah. Yeah, so that's my soapbox. <laughs> uh, all right, so we're running a little long. So before we keep people past how long they want to listen, let's... Uh, you want to you want to do a few more weaknesses, or you want to go ahead and move on to tools for working with C plus plus? Yeah, yeah. Let's let's jump to tools. Um, All right. I I personally really like code blocks. Have you ever used code blocks? I have not. Um. So you know, I do a lot of development on Linux. Um. But there was a time where I was you know doing my home development on Linux, but I was doing my work stuff on windows now i happen to actually be on linux 100 percent. but at that time i really wanted something where i the same ide on on windows and linux and code blocks does exactly that it actually works on mac windows and linux it's very consistent and uh, it does sort of you know it's not as nice as visual studio um but it does like 99 percent of what you need and totally nice. cross-platform yeah what about you uh, another yeah another cross-development uh, cross-platform development is Eclipse CDT. We talked about Eclipse, and Eclipse originally came out as Java only, but since then people have added some C functionality in the what's called CDT, C Developer Toolkit. I, I ah. think that's what it stands for. And so it it basically does the same thing for C. It requires you know some extra setting up and handling, um, but it, it works pretty good. Oh, nice. Yeah, I haven't tried Eclipse Another on Windows. Um, but uh, but I'm sure it's a lot better now. I, I used a really old version of Eclipse, um, but I'm sure they've come a long way. Uh, and then aside from just uh, tools to use to write code, I also wanted to talk about Boost, which is a very popular uh, library for C++, which adds a lot of the features that were now added to the new C++ 11, so like shared pointers and stuff, and just uh, a lot of common uh, co usages that you might want that instead of having to implement yourself, you can just use the boost libraries version and it tends to be very good and well-supported. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. As Patrick mentioned, uh, shared pointers have actually, even though they're just coming into C plus plus now, they've been in boost for years and years and years. So, um, you gotta be using boost if you want to get all of the, um, you know, productivity out of your C plus plus. So C++ is commonly used. We talked about game programming. Uh, we didn't really talk about it, but we kind of talk, uh, alluded to it, which is embedded computers. So things that are low power, low memory, things where you want to be able to have tight control on everything that happens, uh, they're used there. What, where else are they used, Jason, or is C++ used? Uh, so all web browsers, right? Chrome, Firefox, Internet Explorer, oh. all these are written in C++. Um, most you know, huge programs that you can think of um, are probably written in C++. Um, and uh, that just yeah. goes back to our, you know, our uh, explanation of just how, like, it's possible to make just gigantic programs and many libraries and, and uh, you know, and all sort of coordinate. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that pretty much wraps it up for C++. I wanted to say thank you. A number of people have written in to say how they're glad the show is back. It's been encouraging. Yeah. We've had a number of comments and suggestions and that kind of stuff. That's appreciated as well. Um, you know, we're glad to hear from you guys. We enjoy doing this. We're glad that some of you enjoy hearing it. Yeah, totally. We used to announce uh, programming throwdown at Gmail. It's probably good to mention 
Uh, we don't follow that as much now that we have the programming <laughs> throwdown page on G+. Um, so if you, uh, if you want to write to us, uh, we do follow. Like We check it maybe once a week or something like that. So um, you can definitely write to us if you have something you don't want to share to the public or something like that. But um, most of the time, uh, you, you definitely want to check out the G+, page. If, uh, Google Plus. That's right. If you go on Google Plus and you put in uh, Programming Throwdown, it will take you to the Google Plus uh, site for Programming Throwdown. And you can feel free to leave any comments. Uh, we post all the show notes there in addition to the blog. So, yeah, definitely yeah. Add, it, right. add it to your circles. Until next time. See you guys later. The intro music is AXO by Binar Pilot. Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.